Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to Religious Liberty Justifications for Violence, a Legal Analysis. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kelsey Hazard. I am the founder and president of Secular Pro-Life. SPL is an atheist-led organization advancing secular arguments against abortion and uniting people of every faith and none to protect prenatal human beings. I'm really excited about this presentation. Um, although I am an atheist, I have always taken a strong academic interest in religion. My undergraduate majors were religious studies and psychology. And then I went to law school where I just devoured all things First Amendment. So I want to thank Rehumanize International for giving me this wonderful opportunity to, uh, to geek out with an audience. Um, you have probably seen headlines about Satanist groups and pro-abortion Jewish synagogues filing lawsuits against pro-life legislation, claiming that it violates their religious freedom. And maybe you've thought, well, that's ridiculous. You can't just kill somebody and say, oh, but it's my religion. Um, and if that was your reaction, your intuition is correct. I am going to conclude that these lawsuits, these lawsuits ought to fail. Um, but to discuss this issue intelligently beyond just our intuitive reactions requires understanding some key concepts of religious liberty law. So uh, this session is your crash course. I have five housekeeping matters before I begin. One, I have a lot of citations. Um, you can find all of them in the most recent post at secularprolife.org slash blog. I've also dropped it in the chat. And if you're watching the re later recording, uh, there should be a link in the description. Uh, two, a disclaimer, I am a attorney I am not your attorney. This presentation is for general educational purposes only. It is not legal advice. If you need legal advice, you should contact a lawyer who's licensed in your jurisdiction to give you advice that's tailored to your situation. Uh, number three, I realized that this conference attracts attendees from around the world. In fact, I think I saw a poll earlier that about a quarter of you are from outside of the United States of America. Uh, I am focused here, this presentation is specifically about U.S. law. Uh, number four, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the Q&A tab. I'll circle back to them at the end if we have time. If you put them in the general chat tab, I might miss them. So please use that Q&A tab. Uh, finally, number five, this session is going to touch on quite a few belief systems. Satanism, Judaism, Native American spirituality, Santeria, Evangelical Christianity, Jehovah's Witnesses. In the immortal words of Stefan from Saturday Night Live, this club has everything. If you happen to belong to any of the religious communities I just mentioned, I apologize in advance for how cursory and surface level my comments are going to be. Uh, you could devote a lifetime of study to any one of the religions I mentioned, and many people have. Uh, we have 45 minutes. It is what it is, and I'm sorry. Uh, so, all of those housekeeping matters are done. Let us dive in with a Native American church and the case of Employment Division, Department of Human Resources of Oregon versus Smith. That's a mouthful. We usually just say Employment Division versus Smith. Mr. Smith ingested peyote for sacramental purposes during a Native American ceremony. Somehow, his employer a drug rehab center, found out about that and fired him. He applied for state unemployment benefits and he was denied. Oregon's position was using hallucinogens is illegal in our state. You used them. There is no religious exception. So it's your own damn fault you lost your job. We're not paying you unemployment. Mr. Smith argued that this violated his First Amendment right to free exercise of religion. The case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled against him. The court supported Oregon's position. Their reasoning, and I'm paraphrasing here, was, uh, what are you, nuts? We can't start making religious exceptions to drug laws. Every heroin addict in the country is going to take advantage of that. Laws would mean absolutely nothing. It would be chaos. 
<laughs> so he lost, he lost his case. Uh, and the legal standard that was announced in Smith was that if a generally applicable law incidentally burdens religious exercise, that is not a First Amendment violation. The law will be upheld and the state does not have to create an exception or an accommodation for that religious person. So what does the Supreme Court mean by generally applicable law? The best way to illustrate that is with a counterexample. Let's talk about Church of the Lukumi Babalua Ye versus City of Hialeah. I love this case, uh, not just because it's fun to say, although it, it definitely is, Church of the Lukumi Babalua Ye. Uh, I also just find it super interesting and my favorite law professor, Douglas Laycock, happened to represent the church. So uh, first, some background. This is where Santeria makes an appearance. And if your only familiarity with Santeria is the Sublime song, you have excellent musical taste. <laughs> don't practice Santeria, ain't got no crystal ball. Um, just don't pop a cap in Sancho. This is a consistent life ethic conference. By the way, I have no way of knowing if my stupid jokes are landing, so please, uh, please be gentle. Um, Santeria is most commonly practiced in Cuba. It arose from the interaction of African religions brought by enslaved people and Catholicism brought by colonizers. When Cuban American refugees settled in South Florida, they brought Santeria with them. Santeria worship sometimes involves ritual animal sacrifice, which makes it a very foreign and objectionable uh, scenario to a white American audience. When a Santeria priest announced that he was opening the Church of the Lukumi Babaluaye in Hialeah, a Santeria congregation. It did not go over well, um, as the Supreme Court put it in its opinion. Quote, the prospect of a Santeria church in their midst was distressing to many members of the Hialeah community. And the announcement of the plans to open a Santeria church in Hialeah prompted the city council to hold an emergency public session on June 9, 1987. That session and some later ones produced numerous resolutions and ordinances, which taken together prohibited the Santeria animal sacrifices. So this went up to the US Supreme Court and the, the, justice had, the justices had no trouble figuring out that this was not a generally applicable law. It was a unanimous decision. The city argued, hey, they, they, we're just promoting animal welfare and we have legitimate public health concerns as far as the animal remains go. Um, but that was unconvincing because the ordinances were just riddled with exceptions for commercial meat production, for hunting, for pest control, and even for kosher slaughter. The court called it a religious gerrymander. I'll quote again from the opinion, the net result of the gerrymander is that few, if any, killings of animals are prohibited other than Santeria sacrifice, which is prescribed because it occurs during a ritual or ceremony, and its primary purpose is to make an offering to the Orishas, not food consumption. Indeed, careful drafting ensured that although Santeria sacrifice is prohibited, killings that are no more necessary or humane in almost all other circumstances are unpunished. In other words, this law was discriminatory. And since the law was not generally applicable, the Smith standard did not apply. Instead, the court used a much tougher standard, what we call strict scrutiny. There must be a compelling interest in support of the law and the law must be narrowly tailored to advance that interest with the least religious burden possible. Remember that test, compelling interest, narrowly tailored. That's strict scrutiny. Uh, and there's a saying in the legal community, strict in theory, fatal in fact, meaning hardly anything is going to pass the strict scrutiny test. Highly is anti-sacrifice anti law uh, certainly did not. And the Church of the Lukumi Baba Luaye emerged victorious. Uh, so at this point, you might be wondering how this is relevant to anti-abortion laws. Um, after all, we aren't 
targeting a particular religion. We didn't convene an emergency city council session to ban the satanic abortion ritual. We aren't trying to save only the babies conceived by mothers of a particular faith group. We want to save as many babies as humanly possible. That's how pro-life laws are written. They're broad. They're generally applicable. Yes, yes, that, that is right. However, the American public really did not like the outcome in Employment Division versus Smith. A lot of people on both sides of the aisle felt that Smith should have won that case. And it's not hard to see why, right? He's a very sympathetic plaintiff. He wasn't hurting anybody. Native American use of peyote is thousands of years older than the United States itself. The war on drugs really has run amok here. Why couldn't, have Oregon, why couldn't Oregon have just made an exception for him? Don't we have freedom of religion in this country? And that was bipartisan sentiment at the time. So Congress passed a law called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA. And what RIFRA did was take that compelling interest, strict scrutiny test that was used in Church of the Lukumi Babaluaye and say, that's going to be the test for all religious freedom claims, including claims for an exception to a generally applicable law. Now, the federal RIFRA only applies to federal laws, but almost half of the states enacted their own state level RIFRAs. That includes much of the South and also some deep blue New England states. Uh, the end result is that whether you are going to take more of a Smith approach or more of a Church of the Lukumi Babaluaye approach depends on where you live. I told you that RIFRA was a bipartisan sentiment at the time, not so much today. Over the years, increasingly high-profile RIFRA claims involve L LGBT issues. Uh, for instance, conservative Christian florists seeking exceptions from anti-discrimination laws so that they can refuse to serve same-sex weddings. RIFRA itself didn't change, but it acquired this anti-gay connotation that left a lot of liberals with a sour taste in their mouths. And like so many other issues, opinions about RIFRA grew more and more partisan, more and more polarized. And then the Supreme Court decided Burwell versus Hobby Lobby. This was a huge RIFRA case. It was only eight years ago. It got a ton of press, and I'm sure many of you already know all about it, but I'm going to summarize it anyway. So as part of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, whatever you want to call it, I don't care, um, employers of a certain size were required to provide contraceptives, coverage for various contraceptives, with no copay. Hobby Lobby did not object to most of the contraceptive methods on the list, but it identified four that it said weren't really contraceptives, that that was a misnomer. These were really abortifacients. They weren't preventing conception, they were preventing a newly conceived embryo from implanting. Uh, Hobby Lobby considered that to be an early abortion, and the company owner's evangelical Christian faith would not allow them to be complicit in funding their employees' abortions. Hobby Lobby brought a case under RIFRA. The Supreme Court used that two-part strict scrutiny test, remember, compelling interest and narrowly tailored. The court assumed that the government does have a compelling interest in ensuring access to contraception. It was that second part of the test, whether the law is narrowly tailored to advance the compelling interest by the least restrictive means, which is where the contraceptive mandate failed. And that was largely because a religious exception already existed. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, had created an exception had, had given accommodations to churches and religious nonprofits that had a problem with funding contraceptives. In those cases, the government covered the cost without the employer's involvement, thus advancing the compelling interest in contraceptive access without a religious burden. So the accommodation was obviously possible. It was being done. It's just that HHS would not extend that accommodation to Hobby Lobby 
on the ground that Hobby Lobby was a for-profit company. Um, a slim majority of the justices, five to four, said that under RIFRA, that doesn't matter. For-profit or non-profit status doesn't matter. So Hobby Lobby got a succession from the contraceptive mandate. The mandate itself was not struck down, by the way. It's still in effect, albeit with greater, broader uh, religious exceptions than HHS wanted. Women are still getting their pills. Sky didn't fall, but plenty of people were convinced that the sky was falling and RIFRA took another hit in the court of public opinion. The religious liberty challenges to pro-life laws that we're seeing today are largely RIFRA lawsuits. When you read the press about them, the narrative is basically, ha, 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 conservatives, we're using your religion law against you. Like it's some kind of gotcha. Um, hopefully, by virtue of this presentation, you understand why that take is ahistorical. But forget the press. Let's take a fair look at the lawsuits themselves, uh, starting with the Satanists. Uh, first of all, to correct a myth, Satanists do not literally worship Satan or even believe in the existence of Satan. Satanism is a naturalistic system, but you do not necessarily need a deity to qualify as a religion under the First Amendment. Sincerely held moral beliefs will suffice. For purposes of today, uh, Satanism is a religion. And Satanists provide a useful public service, in my view, uh, keeping local governments in compliance with the Establishment Clause. Uh, ah, I see you've uh, put up a Ten Commandments monument. Uh, where do we apply to erect our statue of Baphomet? It's those, it's those guys. You've, you've seen the Satanists in the news. Um, one of the better known Satanist communities is the Satanic Temple which follows seven tenets. The first tenet is one should strive to act with compassion and empathy toward all creatures in accordance with reason. In accordance with reason. Um, unfortunately, that noble tenet goes straight out the window when it comes to abortion. Uh, in that case, they emphasize the third tenet, one's body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone. Classic sovereigns. The satanic abortion ritual involves reciting and contemplating that third tenant while getting an abortion uh, for the purpose of casting off guilt, shame, and mental discomfort that the Satanist may be experiencing about the abortion. So the argument is not that abortion is a required part of Satanic practice. It's not like making a hajj. They're not sacrificing babies to earn points. That's not what's going on here. The argument is just that if a Satanist is going to have an abortion, this is the ritual that goes along with it. And by restricting abortion, you're also restricting the ritual. The Jewish lawsuits, by contrast, argue that Jewish law actually requires abortion, at least in some circumstances. Uh, for instance, the complaint brought by Congregation Lador Vador against Florida's 15-week ban, which is still pending, uh, that complaint asserts that late-term abortion is required under Jewish law if necessary to promote the woman's mental well-being, uh, which obviously goes far beyond Florida's normal health of the mother exception. To be abundantly clear, that is not a universal interpretation of Jewish law. Those plaintiffs do not speak for all Jews. There are pro-life Jews and Jews are welcome at this conference. Let's assume that we are in a RIFRA jurisdiction. If a state wants its pro-life laws to apply universally without granting an exception to anyone who claims a religious freedom to abort, uh, remember what the state has to show. One, the law is supported by a compelling interest. And two, the law is narrowly tailored to advance that compelling interest with the least possible burden to religious exercise. We all know what the compelling interest is. It's human life. The plaintiffs will say, not to our religion, it's not. And I say, bring on that debate. Science of life at fertilization is settled. Uh, and when you read the Dobbs opinion, I don't think you can escape the conclusion that the government now has a legally compelling interest in preventing abortions. Is there any way to promote 
that compelling interest without creating a religious clash. Not that I see. One day with the development of artificial, artificial wombs, uh, maybe that, that would be great. But with current technology, no. So I conclude that anti-abortion laws should survive a RIFRA challenge. They survive strict scrutiny, the lawsuits will fail. But Kelsey, someone asks, what about strict in theory, fatal in fact? Thank you, person who has been paying attention. You should be skeptical. Can I point to any specific legal precedent for the idea that a state's interest in, in protecting human life, in particular young human life, and preventing human death can trump a religiously motivated medical decision? Well, folks, I promised you Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'm a woman of my word. Several Bible verses prohibit eating blood and instruct Israelites to remove blood from their meat. Jehovah's Witnesses interpret those versions to prohibit not only eating blood through the mouth and digestion, but any consumption of blood, including taking blood intravenously. They oppose blood transfusions on that religious ground. This belief is very sincerely held. Many Jehovah's Witnesses would rather die than accept a blood transfusion. Many have proved it. Normally, we trust parents to make medical decisions for their children. But when Jehovah's Witness parents refuse to allow life-saving blood transfusions for their kids, authorities often intervene. And when that happens, the parents go to court demanding vindication of their religious liberty. There's a whole line of cases about this, going back decades. And most of them cite this powerful quote from the Supreme Court case of Prince versus Massachusetts. Parents may be free to become martyrs themselves, but it does not follow they are free in identical circumstances to make martyrs of their children. Oddly enough, Prince didn't involve blood transfusion, or any other life or death issue. Prince was about a Jehovah's Witness who had her daughter um, selling religious pamphlets late at night in violation of a child labor law. But the Supreme Court's rhetorical flourish about making martyrs of your children made it clear how it would come down in a blood transfusion case. And courts across the country took that unsubtle hint. Uh, for example, a Washington court rejected a Jehovah's Witness blood transfusion lawsuit on the, quote, compelling authority of Prince. An Ohio court wrote, no longer can parents virtually exercise the power of life or death over their children, nor may they abandon him, deny him proper parental care, neglect or refuse to provide him with proper and necessary subsistence, education, medical or surgical care, or other care necessary for his health, morals, or well-being. And while they may, under certain circumstances, deprive him of his liberty or his property, under no circumstances, with or without due process, with or without religious sanction, are they free to deprive him of his life. That same court went on to say, the parents in this case have a perfect right to worship as they please and believe what they please. They enjoy complete freedom of religion. But this right of theirs ends where somebody else's right begins. Their child is a human being in his own right, with a soul and body of his own. He has rights of his own, the right to live and grow up without disfigurement. Okay, new thinking. Those were all born children. Okay, allow me to introduce you to the New Jersey case of Honer versus Bertinato. Mr. and Mrs. Bertinato were Jehovah's Witnesses. Mrs. Bertinato was pregnant with her fourth child. This was an issue of RH incompatibility. I am not qualified to explain that in any detail, so I'll just quote the court. Her first child was born without the necessity of blood transfusions and is a normal child. This accords with the medical testimony at the hearing that the mother's RH blood condition adversely affects the second and subsequent children, but rarely is harmful for, the, 
harmful to the firstborn. Second child needed a blood transfusion immediately after birth. The parents refused and the baby's doctors filed an emergency petition. The court briefly placed that baby in state custody just long enough to accomplish the blood transfusion. The child survived and the child was returned to the parents. I'll quote again. Gloria Bertinato's third pregnancy resulted in a baby who also admittedly, excuse me, let me start over. Gloria Bertinato's third pregnancy resulted in a baby who admittedly also needed a blood transfusion to save its life. But defendants again refused to permit this on religious grounds. No legal proceedings were instituted to compel the transfusion. The infant died. For baby number four, the county would not allow that tragedy to be repeated. They were ready. Officials filed their lawsuit before the child was born to ensure that a blood transfusion could occur. The lawsuit, quote, charges that the defendants, by their refusal to authorize the transfusions, are endangering the life of the unborn child and are therefore neglecting to provide it with proper protection in violation of New Jersey law. The court acknowledged that the parents' religious objections were sincere, but the parents' constitutional freedom of religion, although accorded the greatest possible respect, must bend to the paramount interest of the state to act in order to preserve the welfare of a child and its right to survive. The court cited Prince and various other Jehovah's Witnesses blood transfusion cases. And then it asked, should the outcome be any different because this child is still in the womb? And the answer was a resounding no. This was pre row uh, so the court embraced the science and stated, medical authority recognizes that an unborn child is a distinct biological entity from the time of conception. And many branches of the law afford the unborn child protection throughout the period of gestation. Of course, in the Dobbs era, that protection is finally being restored. A pro-abortion American is free to embrace a religious belief that human life does not begin at fertilization, but she is not free to make a martyr of her child. That concludes my prepared remarks. I appreciate your time and I look forward to answering your questions. Um, Elizabeth asked, what was the name of this case? I don't know which case you're referring to. Uh, all of the cases are in that citation, that link I gave at the beginning. Um, and you should be able to, hold on. Are you talking about the most recent case I was talking, the, the last case I mentioned? Honer, H-O-E-N-E-R versus Bertinato. Um, was the case with the, the unborn child of Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, love all the jokes and geekdom. Thank you. <laughs> I, um, I know that we, we cover some dark topics at the Rehumanize Conference. And I'm a big believer in uh, trying to lighten the mood. Um, I don't see much in the Q&A tab, so I'm just going to scroll back through the chat tab and see if there's anything. Here. As a fellow lawyer, I feel that caveat to my core. Yes, thank you, Leah. Um, oh my God, <laughs> sorry, a little, um, the, the poor, poor, poor dog. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. Jews have been pro-life for millennia, so yeah, I, I agree, Joey. Thank you, um, Joey. Rick rolling us. <laughs> Okay. Um, ben says, these seem like really strong precedents, especially because some of them are arguably about letting die rather than killing and are thus even stronger than what you'd need in the abortion case. Excellent point, Ben. Yes, I, I certainly um, hope that the courts see it the same way. Uh, the, the downside to the Jehovah's Witness precedents is that they are older and they are not Supreme Court precedents. Uh, but as I mentioned, the, the Supreme Court precedent in Prince, although not about blood transfusions, has, has largely been uh, taken up in that line of cases. And I think it would um, still function in the same way in the 
unlikely event that one of these religious freedom abortion cases makes its way all the way to our highest court. Um, how would you summarize this to say 240 characters like to tweet at Catholics for choice? Uh, you might need a thread. <laughs> uh, or you can just uh, link to the eventual video of this presentation. I believe in Humanize is going to make this footage available, and then we'll get the closed captions going and put it up on YouTube, hopefully within the next few weeks. Um, but yeah, more, more generally, uh, I think the... I don't know, maybe I should start tweeting at Catholics for choice about this. Um, what are you seeing in the legal field regarding RIFRA changing its function post row? Um, I don't know that it's really changing its function necessarily. So some of the plaintiffs, and particularly the Satanist plaintiffs, I think are bringing these lawsuits not solely uh, because they're pro-abortion, although they are. I think they would also, um, as a, as a strategic matter, like to push on RIFRA. I th I, and I think that's why we're seeing the press around it that we're seeing. Um, this is like, even if they were to lose and they, they have to know that they're likely to lose, uh, this is, this is a press thing. And this is a, a matter of, um, trying to, um, get, get some more public opposition to RIFRA. Um, so I, I don't, I haven't seen a whole lot of traction on that front. I haven't seen any legislatures, um, taking RIFRA off their books, but you never know. Um, David asks, how long, how do you do your legal, re sorry, I'm struggling to read this because other things keep popping up. How do you do your legal research and how long does it take? Did you know most of these cases offhand or did you have to look them up? Um, so I knew some of the big ones offhand. I knew Employment Division versus Smith. I knew Church of the Lukumi Babaluaye. I knew, uh, Princeton, Massachusetts. I knew Burwell v. Hobby Lobby, you know, like I, I refreshed my memory by rereading those opinions, but I knew that that was where I needed to start. Um, and then I did have to do some additional research uh, when it came to the um, the, pen, the pending lawsuits and also the Jehovah's Witness line of cases. Um, I, 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 because I am a practicing attorney, I have access to Westlaw, which is the uh, legal database that was very helpful and, um, you know, also just, I, you know, I started by just doing a general search for law review articles about Jehovah's Witness and blood transfusion that compiled some of the cases. And that was, that was a good starting point. And I uh, was definitely working on this presentation as late as last night. So uh, I'm glad it came together. I am a bit of a procrastinator, uh, but that's, yeah, that's how it all happened. Um, let's see. <laughs> Ben asks, apart from law, what do you think about the ethical argument from religious freedom or religious pluralism that being pro-life depends on controversial slash contested views about the grounds of personal identity and dignity, and so no one view should be legislated for by a pluralist society? And the problem is that your, your law is going to pick a line. That's what laws do. If... if that, 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 that argument, that pluralism argument treats birth like it's a neutral line. It's not. The, the law is going to pick a line and every line is going to offend somebody. <laughs> that, that's, just, that's just life in a democracy. Um, so I don't, I don't find that argument particularly uh, persuasive from our loyal opposition. Um, so, so my, I, I would go a step farther and say that the only neutral way to go about this is to say that you know, human rights begin when human life begins and that that has to be defined in a scientific way um, rather than a philosophical way because uh, there, there's you know, you, all of these um, different guideposts that are being proposed bear a lot of resemblance to insolment. Um, which would be an establishment of religion. I hope that makes sense. Um, given your rationale, how would any abortion be legal without demonstrating an exceptional need such as life of the mother? Um, I, I do oppose abortion other than for the life of the mother. Mother, excuse me. Um, under Dobbs, the state, it, it is still a state by state thing. I'm, 
get, getting into the 14th Amendment argument is definitely beyond the scope of what I can do in the next nine minutes. Um, but the so, so the idea is that you're, you know, the people of a state through their legislatures demonstrate what the interests of the state are, right? So Florida or, you know, let's, you know, take, take like Alabama, right? Al Alabama has um, enacted uh, pretty, pretty strong anti-abortion legislation post Dobbs. Um, that is an indication that the state of Alabama has a compelling interest uh, in preventing abortion and protecting human life. California obviously does not think <laughs> that it has that compelling interest. So that that's, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, uh, but I, I, hope, I hope that helps. Um, how can interested people get involved with secular pro-life and what are your current needs? Uh, yeah, definitely you can get involved in secular pro-life. Um, we are always in need of volunteers. We uh, look for people to write guest pieces on our blog. We look for translators. We want to get our message out in languages other than English. Um, you can email me, uh, info at secularprolife.org, or you can email our executive director, Monica, at monica at uh, secularprolife.org, and uh, get some, connected to some volunteer opportunities that way. And you can also donate uh, via our website or our Facebook page. Um, in Canada, not long ago, an immigrant couple were convicted of the honor killing of their daughter. The couple sincerely believed that it was their moral duty to kill their daughter, but the majority in Canada, fortunately, in the case of that issue, and fortunately, perhaps in other issues, imposed their views on the minority. Sometimes it is good to impose views, not a question, a comment supporting something you said. I Yeah, that that's an excellent example. I would stick with the Jehovah's Witness example just because it's a little less inflammatory. <laughs> I, I'm not in the habit of uh, comparing pro-choice people to uh, uh, supporters of honor killings if I don't have to. I think the Jehovah's Witness comparison is um, more diplomatic and civil, uh, but on principle, yes, you are correct. Uh, the, the same reasons that um, you shouldn't be able to uh, claim the religious exemption to commit an honor killing are, are the same reasons that you shouldn't be able to claim a religious exemption to have abortion. Um, yeah, neutrality just seems impossible here. No neutrality when lives are on the line. Um, oh, Maria wrote, we will be publishing a handful of the session recordings on our YouTube in the coming weeks, but all attendees should have immediate access to all the recordings for rewatch and hop in on Monday. And that access will last for a full year. All right. Thank you, Maria. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm guessing that's only for people who bought a ticket though. I don't think Catholics for choice bought a ticket. It's their loss. It's their loss. Uh, um, okay. We've got about five more minutes together. And I think I went through everybody's questions we might end early which is uh, a secular miracle for a conference like this uh, i see leah is on team westlaw yes westlaw all the way i don't use lexus never have um uh, and herb says thank you Kathy. all right herb did you want to come into the presentation and say anything or I was going to do that and then I just realized I'm in the same room as Kane who is on a panel right now so never mind I'm leaving <laughs> uh, yes Secular Miracle would be a great band name absolutely Ray mm. can you maybe conscience rights for physicians um, oh can I comment on that it's a big problem here in Canada. I unfortunately don't know much at all about Canadian law. I don't, to my knowledge, Canada doesn't have something like RIFRA. Um, so I am unfortunately not the person to ask. But um, yeah, R RIFRA certainly can be used uh, for conscience protections in, in some situations. Um, that wasn't within the scope of what I was re researching uh, for this presentation, but I have seen that anecdotally. Um, the danger there, of course, is that um, you're treating 
uh, objection to abortion as inherently religious, which it isn't. <laughs> but um, okay. anything else? Always heard Canada is pretty bad for conference rights. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I've heard also. Um, oh, something in the Q&A, thank you. Um, what do you think of efforts to argue for pro-life conclusions within religions on specifically religious grounds? E.g., do you think Catholics should be arguing against Catholic for choice, primarily just using general moral arguments uh, to avoid creating the impression that it's really a religious issue? Or do you think there's a role for intra-religious debates to be more well-religious? I, I think that if you um, are part of a religious community and members of your community are out doing stupid things or unethical things, you should go get your back. <laughs> I, that's, I, I have no problem with you using a religious argument with someone that you know to be religious. Uh, now, if you're in a public Twitter argument with Catholics for Choice, then maybe consider that you're not so much trying to persuade them, you're trying to persuade the onlookers. So in that case, you might take a more secular route. But yeah, individually, like in a one-on-one -on -one or small group, setting if you are speaking with co-religionists i don't have a problem with you um using your religious argument that's your business i'm, I'm an atheist that's that's not my realm at all um so something came up in the chat um, um con that's the problem we're having conscience is always being framed as religious but conscience is not itself exclusive to religion yeah and so that kind of gets back to my point earlier about uh satanism being considered a religion um, and you, you can see that also in um, conscientious, conscientious ejector rules for the military. You do not have to be uh, religious to, to claim uh, an interest in pacifism. Um, I read about a pastor who has a ministry flying women from places where abortion is illegal to get abortions legally. That's just gross. Um, okay. I think we are done. Thank you all so much for your time. Um, I am going to maybe hang out a little bit at the Secular Pro-Life Expo booth if anybody wants to continue this conversation. And uh, yeah, th thank you so much for, for dropping in. I really, um, and, and for, for asking such thoughtful questions.